Times Radio Early Breakfast. At 20 past five now, Noah Kogali is with us, a Young Voices UK contributor and policy director at Conservative Friends of the Commonwealth. Noah, welcome to the programme. Thank you very much. Nice to have you on. Right, let us start then with the latest uh, development um, post Meghan and Harry's interview with Oprah uh, this morning. This is getting a few headlines today. The executive director of the industry body for the UK press has resigned. This is Ian Murray saying he's going to step down from his role at the Society of Editors so it could, quote, rebuild its reputation. And, of course, this follows um, Prince Harry saying that some British tabloids are racist and bigoted and the Society of Editors initially denying that and saying that the attack was not acceptable without providing evidence. And, of course, evidence then came from all directions, actually, and, and so Ian Murray has resigned. What did you make, first of all, of the defence from the Society of Editors of the British press in the face of Harry's um, accusation that some British tabloids are, are racist and bigoted? I think it's a very interesting one, because at first, obviously, it looks like he's just dismissing those claims straight out of hand, and that's, that's obviously not very constructive in an environment where... Over decades, we've seen the British tabloid press be um, have that bigotry and, and, and demonstrate that they aren't the most they're not the most caring industry in the world. So I can understand why people have immediately got very angry at uh, Mr. Murray. Um, but I do as well understand that instinctively you are going to defend your own organisation, and that tangibly. It's hard to point to that criticism being racist in itself, so I can understand partially where he's coming from. Mm. Interesting, because uh, you know, the pressure really built on the Society of Editors. The ITV presenter Charlene White pulled out as host of an award ceremony that was going to be put on by the Society of Editors, the British Press Awards, um, saying the organisation should find someone whose views align with yours uh, to replace her. Um, and so, the, as I say, the pressure kind of building in the last couple of days. What, what, do you think the Society of Editors is really quite out of touch with, with how this conversation has gone in the last couple of days? And actually, is that representative of this kind of quite bullish attitude among the tabloid press that they can kind of say and do what they like. If, if this is what their industry body was saying, then it's kind of cover for them to continue with, with really quite overtly racist headlines in some cases. Yeah, I think you're probably right. And I think it's also important to note that in his, resigna- in his resignation, he made clear that he still stands by his original statement, but that he feels he could have made it clearer that he's against bigotry and racism. So that, that's an important distinction to make here. It's, it's not a complete... It's not him conceding that the, the, the press is racist. He's just saying that he should have said it differently, I think. Um, so it's an, that's an important clarification to make. Yeah. Um, is it that's a, yeah, go that on. is for resignation, I think, um, if, that, if he feels that that's, that's caused damage. Mm. Uh, it's an interesting one. Uh, let's go on to another story this morning uh, that I just want to reflect as well. The final vote on Scotland's controversial new hate crime law has been delayed uh, as MSPs debated a whole host of amendments. So basically it, it ran late last night. It was a five-hour session at Holyrood. So the final debate and the vote are expected today. Now this has been quite a controversial um, hate crime law um, and uh, there have been uh, a whole bunch of amendments as I say. But in terms of just explaining um, the bill. Um, Offences are considered aggravated, which could influence sentencing if they involve prejudice on the basis of age, disability, race, religion, sexual orientation, transgender identity, or variations in sex characteristics, sometimes described as intersex, physical, or biological characteristics. It also creates new offences of stirring up hatred, which previously applied only to race, and it abolishes the offence of blasphemy, which has not been prosecuted in Scotland for more than 175 years. Now, one of the concerns with this, Noah, was from the Law Society of Scotland, which suggested that this bill, or certainly an early draft of this bill, was was sort of bringing the threshold for prosecution really to be quite low. Um, I don't know, what's your reading of of the hate crime bill in Scotland as as it is currently being debated and will be voted on later? I think it's a perfect example of legislation that's more about sentiment than substance. Um, and that, that's always really dangerous. So originally that bill back in September got ripped to shreds purely because it didn't even require intent. It just meant that the statement had to be likely to draw up hatred, which obviously is, is ridiculously vague and has no real place in, in law, especially in the modern world. But credit has to go to the SP for at, at some point finally um, switching that. So there now has to be intent to draw up hatred. Um, but it's, it's incredibly worrying that the SNP yesterday cast out of hand 
a Conservative amendment that this shouldn't apply to the dwelling place and that now the Scottish government has the power to regulate conversations within one's own home. And that's an incredibly worrying development and sets a really, really dangerous precedent. Interesting that the Scottish Police Federation said it could result in officers policing speech uh, and could undermine the legitimacy of the police in the eyes of the public. And there, and there was a response from the Scottish government that kind of modified some wording, strengthening freedom of expression provisions. Um, but do you feel that those freedom of expression provisions don't go far enough then in this bill? Absolutely. This, this bill has been full of holes since the beginning. And... Of course, there's nothing wrong with the sentiment. We, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't be pro-hatred, absolutely. Mm. But at the same time, we need to understand that freedom of speech is a fundamental part of, of all Western society, and it must remain so. And this, this bill goes further than, further than one should feel comfortable with, and we should all be very, very worried if, if this gets passed into law about the precedent it sets nationwide. Interesting to consider, I suppose, um, the feeling of necessity for a bill like this. So in terms of you know, some of the laws that we mentioned, there's an argument, isn't there, that, that these laws do need updated. There's, there's a whole new world of online and social media. Uh, there's kind of new methods of communication. Uh, there is a lot of vitriol around, um, which has arguably become more prominent in the last few years. And so is there an argument to suggest that our laws around hate speech, around hate crimes, ha- they do have to be strengthened t- to some extent? No, absolutely, I agree. There's, we're in a new world and that there are new avenues by which one can pursue speech. But the fact that women aren't even covered in this bill or cross-dressers, not, not transgender people, but cross-dressers have more protection in this bill than women do, I think demonstrates how redundant it is. And it is more about providing the image of change rather than substantial protections for people that genuinely need them. Yeah, there was an interesting amendment, wasn't there, from the former Scottish Labour leader, Joanne Lamont, who wanted uh, sex, in inverted commas, added as a protected characteristic, arguing that women were often the target of hate crime, but the Scottish Government rejected that. Um, they instead are establishing a working group to look at whether a separate criminal offence covering misogynistic abuse should be created, and that is uh, due to report within a year. Uh, right, let's move on as well. Noah, there's lots of news around this morning. We want to mention Brexit as well. Um, a really interesting story this. So a Northern Ireland official uh, from the Northern Ireland office is going to be sent to the United States to try to build relations with the administration of President Joe Biden. Um, so this is kind of in the context of, 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 of tensions, I suppose, really, between the UK and the EU um, over Brexit checks on goods going to Northern Ireland, also on vaccine exports, COVID vaccine exports. Um, but an interesting development to, to deploy an official to try to sort of bridge that gap with the United States. Yeah, I think it's a very interesting development and should probably be seen as quite a worrying one because it means that the US is willing to take up a really active role in the domestic politics of of countries that are its allies. So what does that say about what it intends to be its role in the wider world once again? And I don't think there is a coincidence, I don't think it's a coincidence that this has come a day after um, the Friends of Sinn Féin group and Sinn Féin itself backed ads um, in the US that call for Irish unity, quite widespread ones. I don't think that's a coincidence. And you're seeing at the moment this massive uprising tensions where even last week the, the unionist paramilitaries in Northern Ireland pulled their support for the Good Friday Agreement. And I think you're starting to see tensions rise once again. And if the US starts to get involved in that, I think it'll be influence rather than anything positive. It's interesting, though, because the US played quite a fundamental role in, in achieving peace and the Good Friday Agreement in the first place. So why shouldn't the US express their concerns about the potential undermining of it? I think the problem at the moment is, is that Joe Biden has made... Um, He's not disguised where his sympathies lie. Um, and you've obviously got that quote where I think he was probably joking with the BBC a few months ago where he said, I'm not going to talk to you because I'm Irish. And it's, it's that kind of thing that, that's not conducive to, to good faith politics. That, that immediately puts the UK on the back foot. And if the US is meant to be the UK's closest ally, that's a very, very worrying trend. Um, this is not a president who is neutral on this issue. This is a president who knows where his loyalties lie. Um, and that that could lead us down a dangerous path, I think. 
speaking of good faith politics then, let's look at this as well. Labour writing to Boris Johnson, asking him to correct the record after Downing Street repeatedly refused to acknowledge that the Prime Minister was mistaken when he said the Labour Party had voted against an NHS pay deal. Now this was during Prime Minister's questions yesterday um, and Boris Johnson asserted that Keir Starmer and the Labour Party had blocked an NHS budget bill. Um, the number 10 press secretary, Allegra Stratton, declined 12 times, reports The Guardian, to accept that he had been wrong and indicated that he did not feel the need to correct the record. Um, and I just think this is interesting to consider, isn't it, Noah, because what about the, the precedent that this sets? So should we not expect uh, politicians to live up to a better standard than this, that if they make a mistake, they hold their hands up, they admit it, and in this case, they, they correct the official parliamentary record? That, that's where this will be for all of time now. And actually, it is, it is inaccurate, according to the Labour Party. I think it's important to first acknowledge that absolutely he made an error and absolutely I do think he should apologise for it. It is also important to note that the Speaker did deal with this at the time, so it will be noted on the, on the parliamentary record that the Speaker did, did deal with that issue. I think it also speaks to the wider environment of British politics at the moment. So I, I think if the May elections aren't coming up soon, you probably see Downing Street apologise. But the environment of British politics at the moment means that even that soundbite of that apology, that then gets spread far and wide and is used as, as an avenue for attack. And that's, that's, that's politics, Noah, isn't it? It's that, you know, that, that's a political reason to not tell the truth. And that seems a bit difficult to live with, doesn't it? No, I, no, I absolutely agree. And I do mm. think he should apologise. But at the same time, I understand... I understand why that's been resisted. And if we weren't living in this soundbite politics world where mm. that one, I made a mistake, gets played on repeat for months, then you probably see an apology and a correction of the record and, and more good faith politics. But this is clearly an attempt to create a soundbite and create controversy. I still think he should have apologised regardless. Yeah, it's interesting as well, isn't it? Because, I mean, the Prime Minister created this mess, frankly, didn't he, in this context? He's the one who got it wrong. So, you know, it's not as if the Labour Party are, are sort of set out to make hay of this. Actually, they're coming to it after the fact, after the Prime Minister made the mistake. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an opportunity. Mm. Um, and it, it's one that has been created by the Prime Minister making a mistake. Um, and I, again, I, I want to be clear, I do think he should apologise. He did make a very, very clear mistake and it sets a dangerous precedent if you can just sweep things under the rug. Yeah. Uh, Noah, really interesting speaking to you this morning. Thanks for being with us. Noah Kogali, Young Voices UK contributor and policy director at Conservative Friends of the Commonwealth.